Okay, welcome everyone. So thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Where are people joining us from? Some, some people want to maybe type in the chat window and let us know where you're coming from, where you're joining us from. So, awesome, okay, wow, all over the world. We got Egypt, Bradford, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Chennai, India, amazing. Wow, so I'm joining us, I'm joining uh, you all from London, from the United Kingdom. And um, so it's uh, 6 p.m. here, 12 p.m. in Chicago, which is the scheduled start time. So let's, let's get started. Okay, first of all, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to be sharing this uh, with you. At the end, um, if, you, if, you, if you can, maybe share some of your experiences as well. So you might want to prepare for that by, by, by um, you know, maybe finding a quiet room or fixing your hair or something like that so in case you'd like to be on camera. Um, but, um, or we'll just stick with the chat, the chat, uh, the chat window for Q and A. That's, a, that's, that's probably the safest thing if you're not comfortable, but, um, we're going to go straight into things now. I am delighted here to be talking to you about release planning tips and tricks. Okay. And this might be not a hundred percent of what you expected. So, uh, I'll, I'll break it down and, 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 and start off with, um, First of all, just introducing the agenda here. So I'll explain who I am. Some of you know me, some of I, some of I know you actually. I recognize some of the names here. Good to see you all again. And um, we'll also introduce the Agile Coaching Group. And we'll also then explain what this topic is about and then go straight to, into things. So first of all, myself, my name is Abd Qureshi. I'm originally from Canada and um, I live in London for the last uh, 15 years now in the, in the United Kingdom. I do training uh, and coaching all over the world. I am actually still an active software developer. So this is the, I hold a, you know, a few different badges. Um, I'm a certified enterprise coach with the Scrum Alliance. There's only seven of us in the UK. We coach up and down the organizations that we work with both at a, at a team level as well as at an executive level. So I was a director at my last company where I did coaching um, globally. And then uh, I'm also a certified Scrum trainer, which allows me to teach certified Scrum master, certified Scrum product owner, certified Scrum developer courses. But I am a developer and the, the badge that I'm most proud of is certified Scrum developer. Uh, that's, the, that's because um, I take pride in uh, doing what I um, I take pride in uncovering better ways of developing software by actually doing it. Okay. So that's the, what, you know, a lot of the times people ask people, what's the, what's the opening statement of the manifesto? And they say interactions, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Well, it's not really actually the opening statement. Of this movement is we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it, by actually doing it and then helping others do it. So, Yes, I do spend a lot of time coaching and training, but um, I still do uh, develop software actively. And uh, so moving on to the next is, um, I, am, I work with a number of partners all around the world in many different countries. I'm extremely fortunate to work with uh, the Agile Coaching Group. Uh, they're based in Chicago, but I met the founders back in, uh, an absolutely amazing uh, conference that was organized in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And um, so this is a global movement here and I'm really excited to be working with uh, Khaled Rawi and his team once again um, to really promote the ideas of the business agility and agile software development. Uh, they also offer Scrum Alliance courses, which who I represent, I'm from a Scrum Alliance, uh, but also uh, numerous other groups, including IC Agile, Scrum at Scale, and uh, Scaled Agile. Uh, they have coaching uh, programs as well as training programs and uh, from transformational uh, programs to identifying specific areas to focus on. They have a wide range of uh, services that you can, you can make use of. Okay, so on to the topic of release, manage, release planning. Okay, so which do you prefer the top one or the bottom one? What's the difference? 
So the top one says release planning and the bottom one says release planning as well. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer big planning or uh, do you prefer lots of releasing? More planning or more releasing? Okay, we got some people who love planning. <laughs> Thank you, Usman. Uh, some people like releasing. They're more interested in releasing. Okay. Oh, people love, I'm surprised here. Okay, we have a few people who are more interested in planning than they are in releasing. Okay. Why are we so afraid of releasing? Okay. Uh, the, yes, uh, so Mona is saying the focus should be, should be on releasing, not planning, right? You can, uh, you can have lots and lots of meetings and lots of uh, planning, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is actually releasing. So yes, we're interested in releasing. So I'm sorry if you came here to learn about planning, okay? Because I'm not really interested in planning. I really don't like meetings. I don't like big meetings in particular. I don't like having to meet with uh, large crowds. I mean, at least for, maybe for social occasions, but these are painful, painful meetings. Uh, once I've spent three days doing planning for the entire year, all the releases, and we were ready to kill each other uh, after three days. And, um, uh, and in the end, it didn't really matter because about two weeks later, the entire plan had changed. Okay. Based on, so I'm not, uh, yeah, Osman's got a good point here. Measure twice, cut once. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, uh, Mohammed's mentioned working software. Yeah. Working software is the primary measure of progress, right? That's what we believe. So, um, so these are all good perspectives, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I might disappoint you because I'm not here to talk about planning as much as I'm talking about releasing because I don't want to plan. Okay. So for example, um, uh, some of you travel and some of you, will travel by plane. Some of you will travel by metro or underground. So what, what in, in London, where I travel, I sometimes I take the tube, the underground train, and I don't do any planning. I just show up at the train station. Uh, there is a schedule, but I don't even check the schedule. Why? Because when I get down into, onto the platform, there's a train every two or three minutes. So why would I spend the overhead planning? Now, the train, the tube, doesn't carry a lot of people, but it's very, very frequent, okay? Now, in other situations, I might fly to Dubai or Saudi Arabia or Egypt or somewhere or Pakistan or India, and I might fly on an Airbus A380, which can carry up to 700 passengers, okay? Now, I don't just show up at the airport and catch the next plane because the cost and the risk is huge, if I miss the plane. So what do I do? I have to plan how long it takes to get out of the house, see the kids off and get into, find my Uber, make sure the, make sure the taxis and Ubers are, are running and they're frequent. Make sure I get to the train station on time. I have enough time to buy my train ticket. Is it, which, figure out which platform, get to the airport, figure out which terminal is it, North Terminal or South Terminal. Do I have to take a shuttle to another terminal? And then I have to get through security. And then I have to sit in the boarding hall, okay, for like an hour. Doing what? It's not really providing much value, but look at all the planning and look at all the overhead that goes into it. And the reason, and I would do that, and I wouldn't just show up because if I miss that plane, it's going to cost me a lot of money. And it's going to cost me like 24 hours before I can get to the next plane. So I would do a lot of planning in that situation because the releasing is less frequent. Okay. So there's a huge amount of overhead that goes into. So I don't want to spend a lot of time in overhead planning. I would spend time rather releasing, but small releases. Because if I, and if I miss a release, it's okay. The next release is going in two minutes, okay? So I'm always trying to increase my frequency of releasing and reduce my planning overhead. So I'm sorry to disappoint you if you were going to come here to learn about how to do more planning, okay? The other thing is, I also, we did not call this talk Agile Release Planning. And that's because I think it kind of goes without saying. The opposite of agility. Does anybody know what the opposite of agile is? So if I was to look in the dictionary, the opposite of agile. So agility or agile is your ability to change shape and change direction easily. So the opposite of agile is stiff, brittle, sluggish, lethargic, 
clumsy. See, these aren't very flattering terms. So it goes without saying, of course, we're interested in agile release planning. Is anyone here interested in sluggish release planning, lethargic release planning, static, brittle release planning? I don't think so. Everyone is interested in agile release planning. So I don't need to say that. Right? It kind of goes without saying. So yeah, um, we're going to focus on uh, tips for releasing, actually. Now, the term agile is thrown a lot all over the place. So I need to give you some context what we're trying to do and where this idea came from. First of all, this entire movement of what we know as, a, as agile software development was a reaction. It was a counterculture movement to, it was a protest, a protest against heavyweight processes. And in the 1990s, there was a guy by the name of Michael Hammer said, you need to put everything in your company into a process. So people didn't talk to each other anymore, anymore anymore. They had to fill out forms and they'd go through some sort of workflow before individuals and interactions were fine. But now we have tools to automate processes and you interact with pieces of paper and forms that get done. Now we use emails and forms and things like, you know, SharePoint to interact with each other. But the reason they did that was because they wanted to figure out what the companies were doing in the first place. Before that, things, get, things used to get done, but people, nobody knew, the managers did not know how they got done. So they said, we had to, we got to figure out how are things getting done? Because if we're dependent on a few individuals to get things done, well, that's kind of scary for business continuity. What if they leave? What if they want a salary raise? What if we want to offshore their job? We don't know what the process is. What if we wanted to automate their job? We don't know what the process is. So we got to get everything they do, everything they do into a process. And so they ended up with something called heavyweight processes. Things like planning, huge planning processes, integration processes, releasing processes, lots and lots of processes led to heavyweight development. And um, the reason they did that is because they figured out that the idea of the, the idea was that the quality of your software was going to be determined by the quality of your processes. And that was the basis for massive process frameworks like CMM or now known as CMMI, which has kind of fallen out of fashion. But we're talking about 17 process areas with five different maturity levels or the rational unified process, 120 roles, artifacts, and events. These are what we call heavyweight processes. And there was a movement which grew around a technology called object-oriented programming, which led to something called lightweight methods. Lightweight methods. So we don't want to spend huge amounts of time planning. We want lightweight planning. We want lightweight releases. We want lightweight uh, deployments. And so you can see here, these are the notes from the night before the meeting of this uh, famous meeting called the, 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 at, the, at the Snowbird Conference Center where they, uh, where they discussed what came to be known as the Man Manifesto for Agile Software Development in 2001. And you can see the term here. It says everywhere, LWMs, LWMs, LWMs. And these are the notes from Alistair Coburn, who is an influential person in this movement. And I'll give you just a few minutes to read it. Read some of it. What were they interested? What were they after? So they were interested in lightweight methods or lightweight processes, trying to convince those who are heavyweight people like CMM and Rook to adopt lighter weight methods. Why? Not easy. And they also had to come up with a new name for this movement because it doesn't sound very good, lightweight methods. But it says here, the situation is worse than just the Rupp and CMM people. We have CIOs who are convinced they need lots of paperwork to be safe. They need lots of bodies as well. With those bodies, you need lots of managers. And they're more than happy to provide those because they make more money and charge out more people. And then with so many managers, you need more paperwork. And now you're just tracking everything in, in, in little bits and the cycle just feeds itself. There needs to be a major effort put forward that less is more. Less planning, okay? Planning is considered an investment. You're spending money. But the return on investment happens when you're releasing. So if you look at the return on investment equation, are you trying to increase the investment or are you trying to increase the return? Right? It's the return. You want the return now and you want a big return and you're trying to reduce the investment. So we're always trying to do less ceremony and less planning, flying in people from one place to another and having these huge meetings in these big auditoriums. That's kind of what we're trying to avoid. 
and now people even call, have meetings to plan their meetings. <laughs> There's movements out there that have huge planning meetings and everybody all in one room doing a, this massive thing for one big release. Uh, when other companies are releasing frequently, hundreds of times a day. So they don't do these huge meetings. Uh, some will even release thousands of times a day. So without these huge meetings. So um, now there's actually a people who are advocating having a meeting for your meetings. Yeah, free planning meetings. Not just planning meetings, but free planning meetings. And post planning meetings as well. Sorry, there's also the post. <laughs> so... There, with all the, you, what we're asking people to do is really own your own, uh, roll your own process. And a taking off the shelf process is really bloated with generality and bloated by committee. So it ain't minimal. That's exactly what this movement was all about, was reducing committee. Okay? Reducing committee. And this really captures the essence of this. Now, there was one technology that blew open the doors, which allowed people to free themselves from heavyweight processes. And that was object oriented programming. This movement is actually a technical movement. It's not a project management fad. It was founded by a bunch of developers who are working with a new technology called object-oriented programming. Now, what on earth does object-oriented programming have to do with projects? Everything. These are one of the early books written by the guy who wrote these notes. His name is Alistair Coburn, and he has a book called Surviving Object-Oriented Projects. Not programming, object-oriented projects. What on earth does the technology have to do with how we do project governance? Everything. Let's look at an example here. Who here writes code? Okay, let's put it this way. Okay, so those people who write code, I don't want you to answer this question. Now, the people who don't write code, who are the people who've never written code? Okay, identify yourselves, and I want you to look at this diagram and tell me what is the nature of the customer's business. Okay, so people are saying uh, banking, there you go. Now you might be non-technical, but let you, yet you're looking at a technical diagram. Those of you who are technical, can you please explain to Usman and Muhammad, who are not technical, what type of diagram is this? It's a technical diagram. Those of you who are technical, please explain to the non-technical people, what type of diagram is this? Yes, it's a class diagram. Thank you, Ahmed. This is a class diagram. It's a UML class diagram. This is a technical diagram. And yet non-technical people can, can understand it. So that means business people and developers can work directly with each other continuously, which means they can speak the same language. You don't have to translate business requirements into technical specifications. And a lot of it was, was made popular by Smalltalk, which is the first object-oriented programming language. You could now model things in memory based on things in real life. So you can use the customer's, the customer has an, the, uh, has an idea of, um, has a notion of an account. Well, an account has properties and has behaviors, but now you can model that very closely in memory using the exact same language of the customer. So furthermore, that led to rapid application development where you can design things right in front of the customer using a visual tool like Visual Fox Pro, Visual Borland C++ or Visual Basic or Visual a number of tools where you can, you can grab items from the palette onto the canvas and show the customer and verify and say, is this what you want? So you're actually planning the design and designing right there in front of the customer what this is supposed to do. And so the customer is involved with the, with the people in designing and saying and estimating and figuring out how long is it going to take. It's much more collaborative. And so the need for planning in the end or planning for a release is much less because the customer is involved throughout the whole process. Okay. Uh, or the business people are devolved, involved throughout the whole process. And this led to a whole bunch of movements, DSDM being one of, the, one of the first agile software development movements. But the other, a very popular one, is called extreme programming. Extreme programming is probably the second most popular agile software development method. And these ideas around continuous delivery actually were all born from extreme programming. And most of these ideas from the manifesto were actually born from extreme programming. But a lot of people don't like it because it sounds crazy. Extreme. Sorry, we don't want to do an extreme programming. That sounds nuts. But the whole idea behind extreme programming was not how do, you, how do you do stupid things, okay, and show off in front of your friends. It's not about doing dumb things and showing off in front of your friends. That's jackass. That's a different series altogether. We're not talking about doing reckless, stupid things. We're talking, actually, the whole philosophy behind extreme programming was we have technology that allows us to go faster than ever, higher than ever, deeper than ever. 
And so we need to achieve safety. So that was the whole philosophy behind extreme sports, which was safety at speed, not recklessness. And all of these ideas that you see here are how do you achieve safety? Because you have technologies that allow you to go faster than ever before, ever before. release faster than ever before, more work quickly than ever before, develop things more quickly than ever before. And so we're trying to achieve safety at speed. That's the whole philosophy of extreme sports. And that's the whole philosophy of extreme programming. We're trying to reduce the cost of failure. We're trying to reduce the cost of change. Okay. So someone said, measure twice, cut once. That's true. Measure twice, cut once. That's a statement that comes from carpentry. But software developers are not doing carpentry. If you cut wood, you can't uncut it. But if you cut code, you can uncut it. Software is soft. And so you can change things very easily. It's never written in stone. And the, the cost of change of software is much less than the cost of change of wood once you cut it. Okay? So yes, when you're dealing with wood, for sure, that analogy will hold. I will, I will measure twice, cut once. When it comes to software, hey, just go ahead, do it. Make the change in the code and then run some tests and then just find out what happens and then change it again and run some tests, find it happen. Can't do that so much with, uh, with wood. Okay, so changing agility really is about being able to change, change speed and change direction. And there are two things that will prevent our agility. One is this equation here. This is called inertial momentum. It's Newton's first law. Things like to do what they're already doing. Trying to release becomes a big pain. Why? Because you have a lot of stuff in progress, a lot of velocity, a lot of stuff is waiting to get through. And then you have mass. A uh, larger organization will always have more difficulty uh, releasing than if you were a startup, if you were small overnight. But then this is another one, friction. What prevents us from releasing so frequently? Remember, this is, we're trying to reduce our planning. We're not trying to increase our planning. We're trying to reduce our planning. We're trying to reduce the friction, things that prevent us from releasing because we're interested in releasing. And so friction is going to prevent you from releasing. Now, which, where does friction come from? Well, let's look at another equation, right? Friction, the force of friction is coming from this coefficient, which is, is, this, which is um, a, a constant. And then the normal force. The normal force is usually from gravity, okay? If it's your, you're pushing something on the ground. Uh, but if you were to push things off on, on an angle and you're not dealing with gravity anymore, the normal force actually goes down. So your frictional force goes down. And if you have no normal force, let's say you're pushing from the side, then your friction now goes to zero. And so you have frictionless releases. This is why top-down transformations fail miserably from my experience. I have never seen top-down transformations succeed. Okay? But if you want frictionless, then really you need to allow the people who are doing the work plan their own release and come up and do their own self-organization and coordination. If you do bottom up, what happens to your, fr your, your uh, friction? Your friction goes to zero, and this actually goes down to Newton's second law, right? Acceleration. And that's what you want to do. You want to accelerate your delivery, not slow things down through bureaucracy. So um, how to reduce the cost of change? Well, these principles ideas here. Some of these, they might be familiar. Does anybody know? Anybody look at these ideas and can they tell me which of these principles come from the manifesto for agile software development? Anyone? Do you want to name a few that on here? They might, you might've seen them before in that doc, in the document, manifesto for agile software development. Yeah. Encouraging customers to change the requirements as much as they can. Continuous delivery. Increase the frequency of delivery. More delivery. The third one. Okay. All of these. Thank you. Mona Yehaya. Thank you. Well done. So all of them. Yes. And um, Karthika. Well done. Yes. And Ahmed. They're all uh, they're all the principles. Uh, they're not all 12, but there are 12, and they actually were influenced by technological practices. So these, this is called the movement. It's not called, it's called the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Okay, so this movement is about software development. It's not about agile. Okay, and um, 
a lot of these ideas were influenced by extreme programming. And you can see the direct correlation between these practices and techniques that come from extreme programming, which enable continuous delivery. And the very first principle of this manifesto is what? Continuous delivery. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery. Okay, so much so that people have actually written books on it. Continuous delivery, okay? Now, this is what we're talking about. Releasing as frequently as possible and unleashing value as much as you can. And, uh, but this book is a bit out of date now. It's about eight, six years old, I think, more than that. And um, that's how quickly things change here. So spending so much, spending a lot of time on the techniques, it's a bit outdated. And you're going to be coming up with your own techniques. Uh, but what I need you to do is to understand where these ideas came from so you can determine what techniques are um, going to increase your agility and which techniques are going to increase your continuous delivery and which ones are not. So let me take you to one of the most extreme situations. This is a company called Ford Technologies based here in London. They are a technology company. They, one of the things they did was they reduced their size dramatically. So they had managers and test managers and they had processes and they got rid of all of them, okay? So they got rid of all of the managers because the managers are usually the ones that organize on behalf of other people and, and, and organize processes and things like that. And they got rid of their, now they're a group of 50 developers only, literally just 50 developers, okay? And the next thing they did was they removed all of their coding standards, okay? You can program in any language you want, okay? And Ruby, Rails, Clojure, you can program in any language you want and anyone can deploy to production at any time without doing any planning. Sounds ridiculous. Sounds absolutely nuts. And this is their front page of their websites. It even tells you the last seven days, 50 developers have made 603 commits resulting in 250 deploys. And it tells you the name of the person who, who just made the commit and uh, who, just made, who just did the deployment. So this is the front page of their website. So this is called programmer anarchy. You, know, you think extreme programming sounds nuts? Try to convince your, pro, your boss to do programmer anarchy, okay? Right? They will, they'll be freaking out, okay? So, and people think that can't possibly work. You mean you have no coding standards? Anyone can deploy into, into production anytime they want? Everyone has the authority to do that? The answer is yes. And you mean you don't even have coding standards? Anyone can program in any language they want? The answer was yes. And so the first time I saw this, uh, I met uh, Fred George, who was one of the pioneers of this idea. And um, I said, this, you know, this can't possibly work. And he said, you're right. It can't, but it's working. <laughs> How do we know? Their revenues. This company became insanely profitable. Their, their revenue was 10 million per employee. Small company. And a lot of people are trying to scale their operations, but nobody's trying to scale their revenue. Why? <laughs> I don't know. This company didn't scale their operations. They didn't scale their investment. They scaled the return on the investment. And to the point where they became so insanely profitable, so incredibly successful, that they eventually became a venture capital company. Okay? They didn't know what to do with their money. They had to give it to other people. So this is a, a company that did that, and they pioneered an idea of working in small bits of code. Again, back to the idea of object-oriented programming. Small objects exposed as a service, which means you can program in any language you want, but they have to talk to each other, right? So there now you need to expose them as a service. So there has to be some common interface between the two, as long as you're using JSON or something like that. And they were in small, lines, small bits of code and anyone can deploy anything into production at any time. However, it can only be a hundred lines of code or less. No more than 100 lines of code were allowed to be deployed to production. So you have small bits of code exposed as a service. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? You might have heard of it, this way of programming. Small bits of code exposed as a service. Okay. So, yes, this is known as microservices. And it was born from this company here and also born from Netflix. Now, Netflix, they do hundreds of releases every day. Hundreds of releases. Do you think they have a planning meeting for every single release? Do you think they have 100 planning meetings. Now, Amazon deploys thousands of times a day. Every 11.6 seconds, they deploy to production. Do you think they have a planning meeting for every single release? No, they don't. Okay. They get it into production now. 
This is an, an example here where they got into production. And of course, did things go wrong? Yes, they did. But they didn't delay failing. They failed fast and early, and they recovered from it quickly. And they came up with a number of techniques to do that. But one of them is microservices. So this is, this is where we are today. Someone asked the question, why don't we have release planning in the Scrum Guide? Well, because it's a bit obsolete now. We have technologies that allow us to go faster and more frequently than ever before. So people who are still talking about these big, massive release planning, they are, not, they are kind of dinosaurs, really, because technologies allow, allows us to write code in our bedroom overnight and release it to the public on the App Store in the morning or deploy it to the cloud, okay? Before that, you had to commission servers. And of course, you had to do lots of planning, coordinate with IT ops. No, you don't. No, this is, you run a PowerShell script and it's in the cloud, in the data center of your choice around the world. So it's the technology that's allowing us to, technology, the object-oriented technology allowed us to achieve this rate of agility, this rate of releasing, this, relate, this rate of delivery. And it's going to continue to allow us to increase this rate of delivery. Okay, more technological innovation, it's going to increase our rate of agility. Okay, uh, some of the techniques that I found really useful are uh, behavior-driven development. I found that very, very useful. Um, working directly with uh, users and customers. Uh, Test-driven development, continuous integration. You can see these are ideas from where? Extreme programming. It's coming down to the fundamentals, but we've ignored extreme programming in large, in large part because maybe a lot of managers are not, com are not comfortable with programming. So they stay clear away from it. They only want to talk about governance and architecture and planning meetings and all kinds of stuff. But in the end of the day, you have to have the people who know how to do this stuff. And it's going to come down to not your processes. That's CMMI. That's Rational Unified Process. That the idea is that your software quality is going to be determined by the quality of your processes. That's not true. We know that now. The quality of your software is going to be determined by the quality of your people, the people who are doing the work. Okay? So these are some techniques that they've come up with. Okay? Uh, they've innovated. And one of them is behavior-driven development. So this is an idea where you combine three very useful but also sometimes misunderstood ideas into one. User story, test-driven development, and domain-driven design. Now, if you're writing the test first and collaborating with the user, speaking to them directly, okay, that was the original context of a user story. Let's go to the users, let's talk to them, and let's hear their stories of how they develop software. And then what we'll do is we'll write down an acceptance criteria, a little contract. And if those tests pass, then they have to accept the work and we'll use their language. So that's an idea from domain driven design. So you can see an example here of BDD. Now I used to do this at a company in, in London called Pearson Group. They're obviously an international publishing house. And I would write code at night. I would write my tests at nighttime, sitting with the users. And I would write automated tests. This is a tool which writes those automated tests, but we don't call them tests. We call them specifications. But if you right click on it, it actually runs a test. But you work on these specifications with the customer, with the user, so the, there's no need for planning what, what, what gets done because we're doing it collaboratively. So there's no need for a planning meeting. It's just part of, part of how we work. Uh, I would go home the next day, and the next day I wake up, I come back to the office, and my tests are passing. Very strange. I look at my source code repository, my friend in India, Sagar Gadre, is making the test pass. And so we're putting it into production right away. The tests are passing. Why do we need to? I sat with the customer. We decided what we were going to do up front. Why should we wait to have a big planning meeting? We have some features. They work. Let's put it into production. So we put it into production. Okay. And so th this is a technique where you can do work on a bit on a feature by feature basis and you start as soon as the test pass it means it has you have something working and the customers agreed up front what those automated tests are so you're done and use the story the acceptance criteria must be automated i think a lot of people forget that on the back of the user story card you have some acceptance tests and those tests must be automated so there's the front of the card right there and you turn over the card and you see some acceptance criteria and then those acceptance criteria have to be so black and white that even a computer can run them. And then once they pass, you're done. And you have something which is releasable because the test has passed. There's no need for UAT because you've already done this with the user. I think there's someone who wanted to come in with a comment. No? Okay. Okay. Then another one here is the volume and frequency of feedback. So 
one of the reasons why we were so afraid of releasing so frequently is because um, it's not safe to fail. We, when, we, when we make a change to the code, we have to do a lot, of, a lot of testing. And manual testing takes a long time, which is why you have to have very few manual tests. Okay? There are other types of tests which take longer. Often people will automate the manual tests. The manual tests are very UI intensive, user interface intensive, so they'll use a tool like Selenium, they'll do that. But those tests are really slow. Some of those user interface tests take like 12 seconds to run. I mean, if you've got a thousand tests, you got 12 seconds. I mean, how much feedback is that? Not very good, is it? So then you'll do another set type, a bunch of testing, which will happen at a lower level, like systems and integration tests, which happen below the user interface. The user interfaces are very slow. And then you've got tests at a unit level. And if you're writing the tests first using a technique called test-driven development, then you don't need to test as much at the end. So release planning and leaving time for UAT and integration is much less because you're integrating continuously and you have a, 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 what we call a continuous um, uh, delivery uh, pipeline. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't do this because they follow a waterfall process. And so we call this the testing pyramid. But most people end up with a testing ice cream cone where lots of manual tests and very few unit tests. You want all of these tests to complete at the same time. By the time the manual testing is done, you want all the unit tests to be finished as well. So you're, you're doing them all at the same time to save time rather than doing it in a sequential fashion. So you're doing them in parallel. But unfortunately what people do is they have a lot of manual tests. And that's because they're probably following a silly process known as waterfall, where during development, I've seen developers not really writing many unit tests because they don't write the unit tests. They, you can hear them every single day. They're in their daily scrum. They say, I'm done, but I haven't written my J units yet. I'm done, but I haven't written my unit tests yet. And guess what? They don't get written because it's very hard to retrofit unit tests on top of code that's already written. But if you're doing test driven development, you're already doing that. You write the test first before you write the code, before it's designed. So you know it's already designed for testability. But if you write the code first, it's not really designed for testability. It's not a really first class a consideration. Then, if you can't write unit tests, you end up writing lots of integration tests. You have to create lots and lots of entities in, in order to test just one thing that you're interested in. So those are, in, those are component tests. And then you have testers at the end, manual testers. Oh, I feel so sorry for them. They're the ones who run those manual regression packs day in and day out, soul destroying manual regression packs. They come to the office and say, I ran my manual regression pack, I'm ready to release. They say, oh, I'm sorry, I just made one more change to the code. Can you, yeah, okay, I'll go run, run that whole regression pack all over again. I was hoping to do something else today, but yeah, I guess I'll do that. And then they come back four hours later and say, I've finished the whole regression pack all over again. I'm thinking ready to release. I'd like to go home now. I'm sorry, the customer asked for another change. I made another small change. Can you, yes, I'll go and rerun that whole re manual regression pack all over again, and then I'll go shoot myself because there's nothing better for me to do. It's depressing. Look, if you're doing repetitive, monotonous work, get a computer to do that, all right? Don't do it, man. Don't we, we're, not, we're not manual labor. We're, we're, we're software developers. We're, the whole idea is to, get, is to reduce manual business processes and get software to do that. But yet so much of our software development process is manual. Manual testing, manual deployment, manual integration, manual releases. This is getting a bit silly now. So they end up with a bunch of manual tests and then they pass it to the, at the end to the test automation people the very expensive hotshots who come in and they take this manual regression back and try to automate it, but they can't automate it. Why? Because this keeps changing. There's more changes. So they're getting ready for deployment and they say, look, we have to deploy. I don't care if that, autom that, that uh, regression pack is automated or not. We have to deploy. So what happens is you end up with very few user interface tests and, and automated tests uh, at a user interface level. You end up with most of those manual tests never get automated. So this is why we end up with the ice cream cone. But I, ideally, what we'd like to do is do what's called a pipeline. A pipeline is a, is a technique we use it in computer programming. If there's a complex calculation and you break it up into four calculations, you calculate each one individually. Now, if one of them is wrong, then the whole calculation is wrong. But it uses um, uh, optimism, or I think it's called deterministic, deterministic prob probability that it's going to come out okay. So just add them up individually and then sum them up and sum them up even though we haven't checked whether the answer is correct. So this is, happens at a CPU level, it's called pipelining. Well, we do this in software development as well. As we are running our unit tests, which should take maybe 10 minutes, you know, at least back in the day it did, um, 
we should also be writing automated acceptance tests. You know, those UI tests, which are slower, we should be running them at the same time. Now, if the unit tests fail, then the automated acceptance tests are useless because they're, they're running on top of a failed unit test, which you should, we can't release. But run them in parallel. And at the same time, as those automated tests are running, maybe do a bit, little bit of manual testing. Poke at it, do some smoke testing at the same time. Well, we wouldn't call it smoke testing because smoke testing is a slightly different thing, but you do some of that. And by the, by the time it's all done, and if it goes, it goes through the next gate. So it won't get pre-propagated unless the unit tests pass. If the unit tests pass, it'll go to the automated acceptance test. If the unit uh, acceptance test pass, then it'll go to the, and then if they all pass, then it goes straight to production, hands-free, and we don't need to release it, okay? We used to say shippable code. We don't say shippable anymore. Have you notice that? We say releasable, because shippable is a terrible analogy. Once I was in Italy, and I was talking about shippable product increment, and uh, the Italians were talking to each other, and then they kind of, I said, what's the matter? They said, uh, Abid, we don't put our um, software onto a ship. And I said, oh, sorry, I don't mean actually literally shippable. I mean releasable. And it's a terrible analogy. Because shippable means you need to load it, which is going to take effort. Now the product is there. How do we get it out there? But releasing should be effortless. You shouldn't have to load it up. You should just release it. It wants to go. You did all the work. All the tests are passing, and you don't have to do these huge planning meetings. Okay? So we've talked about some of the techniques now, behavior development, test development, continuous integration, and pipelining, which all really come from extreme programming. There are other techniques that people follow as well. One is called dark releases. So I did this once at a, at a, at a, at a Pearson Group. We had to deliver, we, were, we needed basically, we had a year to do a project. And it was a you know, big project. Now, releasing one big project at the end was going to be extremely nerve wracking. And we had four months into the, uh, into the project, we had nothing to show. And our manager, who knew nothing about software development uh, or agile coaching or anything like that, he was just a project manager, he said, can we put it in production? And I said, no, we can't put it in production. You're crazy. It doesn't even hold together. It doesn't look like anything. It's just a login screen with nothing behind it. And he says, we have to win confidence from our stakeholders. They're thinking of canceling the project because they know we had some project issues. And now they're wondering whether they should spend the rest of the eight months worth of budget because they don't know if they're going to get anything in the end. So he said, we're going to have to release something. And one of the guys in IT ops was there in the meeting. And he said, we can do it. And we all looked at him. What, what do you mean we can do it? He said, we can put it into production but only expose the IP addresses internally. Uh, only expose it to IP addresses which are internal to the company. We have our IP address range, our internal Pearson Group IP address range, and um, we can deploy it internally. So we can see it on live kit. So this is amazing, okay? Now this is, this is DevOps in action. This is collaboration between the IT ops people and the development teams working together as one unit, sharing ideas, and um, so we did it and we saved the project. Didn't look like much, but the users and the stakeholders were clicking on it and saying, wow, this is really cool. Oh, look, if I click on it, this is on production? I mean, this is on production? That's the, one of the most painful parts, releasing. And in the process, just releasing those few features in production, we discovered a whole bunch of bugs. For example, our entire architecture was wrong. We need, we need to have a proxy server that, to make sure that we can talk across the DMZ. This is stuff I knew nothing about until we tried to release. Now, imagine if we tried to release everything at the end into it. High risk, right? So we work in small reversible steps. And so dark releases, uh, Facebook does this as well, okay? One of the things they do is they release everything into live, not just into behind the company's firewall, into um, internal IP addresses, but everything into live, except for the user interface. So the user doesn't see it. Now look at the advantage of that. You get to test, performance, security, load and all this kind of stuff and, and, and um, resilience and all this kind of stuff they get to test in safety, okay, by really hammering it. And they will, they will do that. And then when they're sure everything's okay, then they'll, they'll, do, they'll do that. Uh, another technique is called traffic throttling. And we did this at EasyJet. EasyJet is a, a big airline here in the United Kingdom. They're a low-cost airline. And one of the things we did was we had to rewrite the entire easyjet.com platform. So I used to work for Hitachi Consulting, and we were charged with doing that. And um, now this is high risk. 99% of the revenue comes through the easyjet.com website. So if you get it wrong and the whole thing falls over, it's, you're, you're finished as a, as a business. So we did something called traffic throttling, where we wrote a 
feature on the new platform, the new technology, and we deployed it to production. But we diverted 1% of the public traffic to that website, whereas 99% went to the old website. And we discovered a whole bunch of defects, but it didn't disrupt the business. Then we fixed them and we added new features and we turned the dial again. And we, so we didn't have these big planning meetings. We just said feature, put it into production, learn from it. Next feature, put it into production. And we found defects continuously, of course, because you cannot, you might have a very talented testing team. Some people say we can't release until we have, we test all of it. Look, we had something like 15 testers, but our testers, no matter how bright they are, they will not be able to compete with the stupidity of your users. Okay, your users will find very creative ways of breaking the software that your testers will never think of. They'll look at it and say, wow, that, that is so stupid. I can't believe anybody would use the software that way. That is so amazing. I never would have thought of that. So give it to your public to test. They will not, you have millions of users. In other words, you have millions of testers. Just make sure you do it in such a way that it doesn't break, um, it doesn't disrupt your business. Traffic throttling. So we kept on doing that feature by feature. 15 months later, we had 99% of traffic going to easyjet.com version two and 1% going on version one. And we quietly switched off to version one. Okay. Another one is called feature toggling. This is a no brainer. A lot of people do this. What they do is they release stuff into production, but uh, it's switched off. It's dormant. It's got a toggle on it. It may be a configuration file. And then you go to the configuration file and you switch it on. And then it gets exposed to your users. And then you can determine whether it's good or bad. Maybe it was a really bad idea. What are you going to do? Another release? No, you don't have to do another release. You just go back to the configuration file and switch it off. So the system is quite intelligent to do that. Uh, the other one we talked about is microservices, which we talked a little about this, and the idea of containers and evolutionary architecture. Um, I do a lot of work in the Middle East. And I really think people in the Middle East, I think they really get agility better than we do here in the United Kingdom, uh, particularly evolutionary architecture. So if you notice in the Middle East, you have buildings, and in India as well, in India and Pakistan, you've got these buildings, and they have a floor, and then you look at the, you, look, you stand out, you look outside of the buildings, and you see these reinforcement bars coming out of the floor, out of the roof, out of the, out, out of the top roof. And you think, what are those for? Well, that's for the next floor. But the house is in use. It's a, it's a, it's, there's a family living in it, but it's only one floor, and they live downstairs, and the chickens and the goats live upstairs. And then as the family expands, uh, you know, the, 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 the grandfather moves to the top floor, the bottom floor, the family moves to the top floor, you build another floor and the chickens and the goats move to another higher floor, okay? And you just keep on building as needed, but the software is still usable. But if you look at on the right-hand side, that's an example of an architecture which is not open to change. It's sandwiched between two houses. Uh, it's not gonna go up, it's not gonna go out. And so you pretty much do a waterfall approach here where you do all the architecture up front and it doesn't change for a hundred years, okay? So the, 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 the house is not useful until it's completely done. You cannot live in it. Whereas uh, in the Middle East and in, in, in India and um, in, in other countries I've seen in Pakistan, where the house is livable and it's still being developed. So this is called evolutionary architecture, okay? All right. So one of the, one of the ideas we talked about was um, uh, uh, microservices, which allows us to do evolutionary architecture. And this whole movement, the level of agility that you want to achieve is gonna be determined by your technology and your technology practices and your architecture. You can talk about, you can plan all you want. You can have lots of documentation and lots of racy diagrams and lots of people talking in meetings, but in the end of the day, none of the stuff, you will not be able to achieve the level of agility that you get from Microsoft and Amazon and Google and, and, and Netflix unless you innovate and come up with new techniques and technological practices that enhance and enable agility. Okay, so with that, uh, I would like to open up to questions. Uh, we did have one question here. Uh, why did release planning, why was it removed from, from the official scrum guide? Uh, it, I, I, it was removed in 2011. So, you know, that's a long time ago. But that's how far technology has come. Before that, to do release planning, you had to commission servers. 
we don't have to commission servers anymore. By the time you commission a server, your competitors already delivered another feature. So, you know, I used to have to commission laptops when I taught my certified Scrum developer course and spent three days prior to that planning and sys prepping all the machines. I don't need to do that. A few years later, I went around with a stick, a USB stick, which had the entire thing. It was all virtual. Technological advancements allowed me to become more agile. So I just put it in one place and then I just copy it onto the computer. So how, where does my planning overhead? It's gone, right? Oh, but still, do you know how long it takes to move a five gigabyte image from a USB stick onto 15 laptops? Man, what a chore, right? I don't want that level of agility. So engineers are relentless. We are always trying to make things better. And so we do. Now we have the cloud. Now I'm in the cloud deploying to the cloud. I was once, literally, I was once on an airplane flying from, from, from London to uh, Washington, D.C. And I was up in the cloud somewhere in Iceland and they had Wi-Fi. Talk about technical excellence, yeah? I was up in the cloud and they had Wi-Fi and I'm in the clouds and I say, hmm, I will deploy to the cloud because I didn't have time to go and set it up. And so I deployed it to a data center in Washington, in the Washington area. So by the time I land, it's all set up. Two weeks to commission a server, now it takes 20 seconds. So this is what enables, this is what reduces our planning overhead uh, dramatically. Um, okay. Uh, and we spend more time uh, actually uh, releasing rather than planning. Any, any questions, any other questions? There's a... Any other questions or um, you can put them in the chat window and uh, there's more, more things I can share with you, things that other people have done, but uh, I'm one person and despite my, so the question, does that mean no planning from start to finish? No, it's not about doing no planning. It's, doing about, it's about doing as little planning as possible. As little planning as possible, okay? So yes, plan but it depends on the nature of your industry. So for example, I used to work in aerospace and guess what? They plan. If they don't plan, people die. Right? It's not safe to fail unless you can simulate conditions using software. So that's what people do now. They simulate everything using software so that they don't have to put 800 people on, or it's 300 people on an airplane and see if it flies. It's all through simulation. So it's safe to fail, you, safe, you, fail, you fail early and, on, and, and often. But, uh, we're trying to do less planning, less overhead. And what's going to enable us to do that? It's going to be technology. The more adoption, the, the, the tools and techniques that you adopt are going to help you reduce your overhead. Um, you know, for example, the fact that we're having this meeting, it's enabled through technology. It's a level of agility we didn't have before. Before, the last time uh, Khaled Rawi asked me to talk, talk, I had to fly to Riyadh. And I had to spend a huge amount of time Oh, talk to, talk to um, uh, the organizers, uh, Anas Dawood and uh, Khaled Rawi, how much effort went into that conference. But now I can do it over Zoom. So less planning. I don't have to book tickets. I don't have to get a visa. So this is what enables agility here. So less planning as little as possible. Okay. Right. Uh, sprint planning release, different from release planning? Yes, it is actually. So now we're talking about Scrum. I wasn't intending to talk about Scrum in this course, in this um, uh, seminar. But yeah, in Scrum, we do de we decouple release planning from sprint planning. Sprint planning is planning the sprint. Okay, now how much you're going to get work? How much work? Uh, what problem are you going to try to solve in the next two or three or four weeks or one week, whatever how long long your sprint is? Uh, whether you release it or not, that's the decision of a product owner, and the product owner can decide to release several times a sprint. Okay, and there's some product owners who release every day. And, the, and, and then they'll, and some product owners, they'll have something which is releasable every sprint and then they'll won't decide to release it until after three sprints. So that's possible as well. The, 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 the sprint planning and the release cycle are completely decoupled from each other. And some will release hundreds of times a day and they'll sprint every, every two weeks. Developers need to have o, uh, an overview of future business needs to have a better code design. How do you achieve that? Yes, that's a good idea. It's very important actually, you're right. So how did they do it at Forward Technologies? Okay, uh, I forgot to mention this. So thanks for bringing this up. The development team at Ford Technologies, remember they didn't have any business analysts or testers or managers. They were just a bunch of 50, 50 developers and anyone could deploy anything into production at any time, provided there were two conditions. One, you had to program, program in microservices. And if things failed, 
everybody got a text message and they knew that there was something wrong in production and they fixed it within a few seconds, okay? But the second thing is, you better have a good reason for why you're deploying into production. You have to come up with the business case. The developer is a business person now, okay? We don't need business people to translate requir uh, requirements into technical specifications because we're, 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 we're connecting the users directly to the, biz the, uh, the, the technical people and the technical people are working directly with the users. So you're right. You, when, you, when you connect people directly, right? And we say this in the manifesto, business people and developers must work directly, daily. Face-to-face -face communication is the most effective way of communicating. That conveys meaning, purpose, and so, the, and you do this every day, okay? So we don't just do it every month in a big planning meeting. We do literally do it every day. So what happens is the developers have a much better understanding. They become business people in themselves. They understand the business uh, and they, because they're working directly with users. Okay, so I hope that answers the question uh, for Kareem. Do you have other examples out of the IT basket? Um, and either IT software person in the first place. I'm a process development improvement and governance manager, right? Okay, right, okay. So uh, yeah, I do have another example I wanted to share with you. Um, again, it's gonna come through technology. And the more we're aware of what technology offers, the more I think you'll be able to benefit from these ideas. So uh, let me just stop sharing my screen here. Netflix is a champion of continuous delivery. They release hundreds of times a day. And one of the things they do is they do less testing. And what they found is that quality goes up when you do less testing because you're, 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 you're doing small releases, less testing, and you're having to sift through less code. And, you know, might, think about microservices, right? 100 lines of code. And so quality goes up dramatically. And uh, do things go wrong? Yes, they do. But they've anticipated that. They've come up with a technique to anticipate that. In fact, they have a piece of software that's sitting on production right now. If you go into Netflix night, there's a piece of software that's sitting on production right now, which is wreaking havoc. It is causing problems on purpose. They purposely wrote a piece of software that would go around smashing servers, blocking firewall ports, creating DDoS attacks on your live network. It's called Chaos Monkey. And they, they deploy this into live because they want to make sure that their systems are able to deal with the chaos. So they spend less time on planning and they spend more time on resilience, okay? How quickly can your software heal itself and recover from disruptions, which will inevitably happen when you're dealing with something on a global scale like this, right? So it's called Chaos Monkey. And so the system takes care of itself. Uh, this part of the network switches on, that part of the network is all automated. And uh, during the release planning meetings, they're not even, just, so during the, during releasings, sorry, during the release, not during the release planning, during the release, most people in companies, they're up late and no one goes home till this thing is released. They're there on a weekend. They got pizzas out and they're there checking and going through checklists and all this heavyweight kind of process and stuff. And at Netflix during the release, where are they? They're at the release party. During the release, they're not allowed to be at the release. They have to be at the release party because they've written their software to be resilient. That's how confident they are. And do things go wrong? Yes, they do. So they had to write something more aggressive than Chaos Monkey. They now call it Chaos Gorilla. If you want, it's all there on, um, it's more aggressive than Chaos Monkey, but you can find it. Uh, yes, they, that, that's a lot of release parties. You're right. <laughs> they do celebrate quite often, but they, they, they do release thousands of times a day, but we're talking about major releases. So there are smaller releases than there are major releases but they're always releasing continuously. We call it continuous delivery. The very first principle of the manifesto is continuous delivery, okay? Uh, yeah, so during major releases, they're not allowed to be at the release. They have to be at, um, let's say they were expanding to a new region, right? That's not business as usual. So those types of releases will require a bit more ceremony. And uh, back to Muhammad's question, do you stop planning altogether? No, you just plan enough and reduce your planning as much as you can. And uh, okay. You need, so Mohammed is saying you need a translator between business and technical, but I think you just showed me during this exercise that um, I showed you a technical diagram and it was Osman and, and Mohammed uh, who didn't have a technical background. And yet you looked at, you saw a technical diagram and you were able to interpret and see exactly what's going on. That's the power object oriented programming is you don't need people to translate business requirements. Uh, those of you who've only program in object-oriented programming languages, 
um, we, we had to literally learn a, a language it's called a software specification language to translate business requirements into technical specifications. That was before we had object-oriented programming, but now you don't need to do that. You could actually use BDD, sit there right in front of the customer. You saw it right in front of the customer using their language. It looks like plain English and you can right click on it and it writes code. That is the business requirement. That is the technical specification. That is the code. That is the test all in one place. Okay, um, I think we're out of time now. So um, I'll see if I can get the last question in here. Uh, product owners would like to set expectations to stakeholders regarding when things can be released. Is there any alternative way to do it other than through release planning? Yeah, just release it. And they say, is it, it, when are you going to release it? And you say to them, well, we already released it. Do you want to see it in live? There, have a look at it. All right, but you can only do this if you work in small steps. Okay. All right, I can tell you when the train is coming or you just show up at the station. And you'll, it's just, when's the next one coming? Two minutes from now, right? Work in small reversible steps continuously. Reduce your sprint lengths. Reduce your uh, uh, release intervals. We're talking about continuous delivery, okay? Okay. Managers prefer to have a product roadmap to achieve that without release planning? No, of course not. Uh, well, product roadmap is a product backlog. So that's all it is. If you have a product backlog, which tells you the order in which you're going to release things, that's called a product roadmap. This is hit. Now it's a product roadmap. Now it's a product backlog. It's the exact same thing. So the product owner's job is to make sure that we have transparency on the order of things that are going to be released. So yes, we should have a visibility of a roadmap or a backlog. And the product owner will be sequencing and ordering the items and say, this one will be released next and this one's going to be released first. And that's, that's the sort of thing that the product owner will do. But we still should be trying to aim to release uh, continuously using the techniques that I talked about. Okay, so I think we're all done the questions. I'm sorry, those of you who like more planning, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, okay? Sorry, there's another question here. So, Hale, hey, if the product backlog is estimated, the product owner can estimate when the features are going to be released? Yeah, I think so. If you deliver frequently, you know that it's going to come every two, two, three minutes. But if you have large items and you have less frequent delivery, then it's going to be harder to predict, okay? And uh, there's going to be a more of a need to predict. So if I, I need to pr spend more time predicting, if I take an airplane with 700, uh, uh, 700 passengers uh, on a double-decker, uh, I need more planning. But if I go and show up at the train station, I don't need to plan. I just get, get my next train, okay? So you, you see, if you're delivering all the time, then there's just less need for estimating and planning. The reason why we estimate is so that, and plan is so that we can figure out when it's going to be released. But if you're working in small steps, that reduces the overhead dramatically. Okay. Um, the product owner will be able to estimate, yes, but they, they don't have the final say on the estimates. It's the people who are doing the work. But the product owner needs to make sure that everything in the product backlog is estimated. And there's supposed to be, you know, tracking how much work is left and things like that so that they can, they can decide whether, whether they should release. If they are at the end of the sprint or maybe in the middle of the sprint, do they want to release now? If not, when is it going to be ready? So the product owner is involved. Business people and developers are working on a daily basis. So there's planning all the time. Having a big planning meeting is a bit obsolete. Okay, everyone. I think that's it for questions. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.